Okay. This is an NCA Geiger counter. NCA being Nucleonic Corporation of America. Uh, they later changed the name to uh, Nucleonic Company of America for some reason. Uh, this thing was made oh, about 1950. Maybe a little earlier. Um, I've looked this model up. I've, well, I've tried to look it up. Uh, but it, uh, I, I can't find any information on this specific model. The model of this is DM1D down here. Um, serial number 9, which is kind of interesting. This may have been a, an early prototype. I have been able to find similar models, very much like this, uh, but they only have three knobs. So they combine some functions. Um, so that's kind of what makes me suspect this is an earlier model. Uh, I bought this, oh gosh, about 25 years ago at a flea market. I think I paid five or ten bucks for it. Uh, and the guy told me it worked, and I brought it home, plugged it in, and sure enough, it did make many clicks. Um, kind of set it aside uh, for years and years and years. Learned a few things, brought it back out, and brought it up on a variac slowly to reform the caps. This thing runs on fairly high voltages. And uh, yeah, while it did basically work, uh, it, there were some problems with it. So I had to do a little uh, parts replacement. We'll get into that later. Uh, for now, we'll fire her up and uh, make some clicks. Here's the original probe that came with it, right here. Here's the you know, the chass the, the outside cover of the for the chassis. This thing is really rugged. Um, they were used for, um, from what I can tell, in red, have read. Uh, they were used uh, primarily for training purposes for civil defense folks. So uh, let's. Oh, she's plugged in. Let's turn her on. It's got vacuum tubes in it, so it takes a little while to warm up. It has a <clears throat> speaker in the back to make fairly loud clicks, uh, which I guess would be pretty good in a classroom. Um, it also has a neon bulb here, NE51, uh, that will flash every time it gets a count. Now I've already preset this up. It has a uh, voltage adjust. I've got it set to 900 volts. What this dial here right now is set to is high voltage. And that's where you adjust the voltage according to what probe you're using. And this probe wants 900 volts. Uh, we'll show you a little bit about that later. Uh, you can go up and down a little bit and it'll still pretty much work. You know, plus or minus 50 volts or so. And it, it'll be pretty close in spec. So, uh, it's got this thing, the top range is 50,000 counts per minute. Not, not too shabby. Uh, the lowest range is 500 counts per minute. So it has these ranges. It, it also has a cal position, which is interesting. Get to that in a sec. It also has four different time constants while it's counting. Um, one being the uh, shortest, four being the longest. And indeed, most of the capacitors I had to replace in this thing had to do directly with those, uh, this setting, the time constant, because those that's where they're used, electrolytics. So, it's in high voltage mode, so it's reading, basically this is a voltmeter, zero to 1500 volts. Uh, the minimum on this thing, the way things are set up, is just just under 600 volts. It looks like 550 volts. Um, the maximum, it's possible to get this thing to peg the needle, but we don't want to do that with this probe. So, there's the probe. You can see there's some background. There's no noise because there's a speaker volume. And right now that speaker volume is turned all the way off. It's kind of nifty the way they did this so you could adjust it. It's pretty loud.
you'd have no problem hearing this in your average sized classroom. I'll put that about halfway. In the cow mode, for each range, uh, it's difficult to, to you, you can't, it, it has adjustments for each range, but in the cow mode, you would expect to see 3,600 counts on here. It's off. It's no, well, it's a little noisy. Cow mode. Now there's 3,000. And it's, it's pretty doggone close. That'd be 35, 30, about 3,600. Well, so, looks like the uh, meter circuitry's pretty close. I have never calibrated this. I have replaced components, but I've never calibrated it. And there's a bunch of pots in this thing. So anyway, going into count mode, we'll start with 500. 500 counts per minute, that'll be full scale. And this is where the time constant bit gets a little bit important. You can see what this is doing. Each time it pops, each time there's a pulse from the from the Tiger Mueller tube, bang, it bangs the meter. Well, how do you make counts per minute estimation? Look, you can't. So it has this. You can increase the time constant where it will average out, and this will slowly creep up to the average between zero and whatever it was pulsing to, which this meter can't keep up with. So this this time constant set on the highest for really low count rates like background. That's what it's useful for. Then it's that's probably about where it'll it'll sit. You can turn the time constant back a little bit, speed things up some. You can see the needle jump some, and you might get a visual idea of what the average of those is between where the needle goes here and where it goes here. A little tougher to do, but you get a quicker result. Again, down makes the response a bit quicker. Yeah, you still might be able to make use of that if you're careful and used to dealing with these things. Uh, but in the fastest time constant, one real low, with real low counts, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of dicey. However, if you increase the full scale uh, multiplier, in other words, right now, if what we were looking at was 500 counts per minute full scale. Well, now we're looking at 15,000 counts per minute full scale. So even on the faster time constant, these individual pauses we're seeing are not going to disturb this much because of most of this is all down in the weeds. So it's kind of a trade-off. I like that this gives you the ability to fiddle with both the counts for per full, well, full scale and the, the time constant and the speaker volume. And the voltage. This thing, you could probably you pretty much put any dog on near any uh, Geiger Mueller tube on it probe, and uh, it'll it'll work well with it. And uh, as I said, it has a bunch of pots in here. I mean, there's all kind of calibrations for it. I, I and I've never touched them. Uh, seems to work as is. There are reasons why I haven't messed with them. Uh, so anyhow, uh, let's go ahead and add some source to it. I'll turn the volume up a little bit. Yeah, let's see, we'll put this on. That's make it 500 full scale. The lowest the lowest range. This is my source tray. One of them. Obviously that's kind of a useless reading on the meter there, so let's crank the Time constant up a little bit. So it looks like it's somewhere between two and three hundred counts per minute. Ah, but see, average over a shorter period of time, it looked like two and three hundred. Maybe it's maybe between one hundred and fifty and two hundred and fifty. So, mitigate that. 
slow things down a little bit. It'll take a while for this to creep up, but it will give you the average, assuming everything's working right, give you the average counts per minute. You get the idea. Don't want to break the meter. So, turn this off. Interesting way it cuts out. Uh, I'm going to unplug it. Because we're going to inside a little bit. So, the probe. This is the original probe that came with. It's got a what kind of nifty uh, method of securing it. Uh, custom made looks like uh, looks like I'm pretty sure this is brass non-magnetic uh, nickel plated probably very well done very shiny and our RG58U on it cable coax I've already liberated the screws from this so we can pull it apart and there's a tube nuclear Chicago radiation counter now this says type 00834 uh, serial number 5D looks like handwritten on there DC operating volt 900 uh, mica 1.4 milligrams per uh, per square centimeter that has to do with the thickness of this window which is the that's where the radiation goes in the business end of this tube you do not touch this ever with anything uh, that thing is it that's pretty thin uh, they that'll pop so quick because this thing has a partial vacuum in it. And there's some gases in there. I think in this one it's um, neon and uh, a halogen. I know this is halogen quenched. Uh, I tried to look up the part number but, or the type, I guess, <laughs> uh, and couldn't find anything. Although I did find images of this same tube looking exactly the same with the same specs but for the type number and the type uh, was uh, I got it written down here I'm looking D34 with this tube now it's, a, it's interesting it's a four pin base so you tube guys would be familiar with that little socket and uh, pretty rugged machined parts uh, they put together this probe and you can actually uh, see looking in there when this thing uh, arcs inside you can see it it's, it's dim uh, but you, but it can be seen very very interesting that it still works is amazing that I haven't killed it is even more amazing so put it inside Connect it. Things out of the way here. Okay, so the rest of this beast. I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna do a couple things. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and it, it, later on, but the first thing I'm gonna do is put a bit more harsh light on it. The lighting in here isn't fantastic. up a bit. Unplugged, good. Um, this thing, it's got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five vacuum tubes in it. Uh, most of them multi-section. Uh, it has, it actually has some solid state, I'll show that later. It's got some uh, selenium rectifiers in it. Uh, interesting. Uh, this is one of the caps that went bad on the thing. The, like I said, this thing was made in 1950. This value of cap with this voltage is a little bit rare a beast because things ran on higher voltages. This is actually part of that time constant bit. 
that I was showing earlier. Uh, it dried out. Fortunately, this is actually, uh, I believe, Bakelite, this, this housing. Uh, it's one I'm familiar with, used as uh, motor run capacitors in mo modern. Uh, motor run capacitors made by Mallory. And uh, so, it, yeah, it dried out. It was no good anymore. Uh, rather than just tack a bonded cap across it and isolate it electrically, I, I opened it up and put a, a modern capacitor inside of here, which is about as big as my thumb uh, for this value and voltage these days. So that's, that's what this I wanted to keep the vintage look of this. It's just too cool uh, not to have. Um, uh, this here is a 6CM7. It's a, a dual triode, uh, half of which actually drives the speaker through a typical uh, tube to speaker matching transformer. Um, this is a 66. Uh, that drives the, that's, that's it's a power amp, more or less, uh, that drives a choke a rectifier cap and a, a boost configuration so that's responsible for uh, the high voltage. He, he drives the, the output to the that supplies the high voltage to the tube uh, which is fairly uh, you know, adjustable and fairly well regulated turns out. Obviously there's a speaker here typical radio speaker full size. A beefy transformer Power transformer supplies every the voltages that all you know that everything needs. They probably could cut away with half something half of this size. Uh, they they I guess they were figuring uh, you know robustness. Uh, this thing is pretty rugged, pretty stiff. Uh, this is just a choke. It has to do with the high voltage generation coming from the tube. The uh, frequency, I, I, I haven't measured it, sounds to me to be about maybe a kilohertz or somewhat lower than that. It's switching frequency for the high voltage power supply. Up top here is a selenium rectifier, just a huge stack of tiny little disks in there. Each one is uh, probably good for 20 volts or so, but this thing has to rectify what, 2,000 volts? give or take. Uh, filter cap across it, boost cap. Make sure you can still see here. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, speaker matching transformer. A uh, couple more tubes here. This is a uh, 6U8A. It's a triode and a pentode all in one package so it's basically two tubes in one. This is the uh, rectifier. It's a 5Y3 GT. Well, that's what's spec'd here. It actually has a mill uh, part in it, which uh, has better uh, specifications. Either would work. Obviously, this one does. A pretty, pretty tube, brown base. Uh, back here, this is a 12AT7. Uh, another dual triode, two tubes in one package. Uh, both are fairly high gain triodes. Not not much power, but high gain. Uh, this is the original cat that was in here. Um, it reformed just fine. It does every time. Aerovox made some pretty good stuff. It's actually three electrolytics in one can. Uh, pretty small can and then uh, rated for 500 volts, 500 volts, and 350 volts. Uh, that, that, that still works is uh, not stunning, but uh, very interesting. And down underneath, let's see if I got a good angle over here. here. Oh, that'll do. I had to replace, as I said, a number of capacitors in this. The big black one up top. One stuff back here. This thing was two microfarad, 600 volts. Now, back in the 50s, that was a big honking capacitor size-wise. The thing was like an inch in diameter and two inches long. I uh, had to replace that. He got soggy. And here, there's a, I guess, it looks like phenolic or something. I'm not sure, but there's a board with three electrolytics on it, uh, which had to be, well, three replaced. I put, you know, ones I could find that were similar. 
in um, edge that still worked. Uh, these these are more modern, but they're they are vintage. Uh, things got uh, another selenium stack here, selenium rectifier. No idea what that's for. I'm I'm guessing it's it was a bias rectifier for one of the tubes, uh, grid bias. Um, down here is a diode. I've seen these before, th um, about this age. I don't know if that's silicon. I don't think it's silicon. I don't know if it's germanium or this possibly could be uh, selenium. I don't know. Uh, but hidden up and around here, it's, I know you're not going to see it, but right here, there's a, a glass diode, which um, almost certain is a, is a cat whisker a germanium diode, uh, like a 1N34A or something like that. Uh, this thing really made well, uh, point to, all point-to-point -point wiring, except for a couple of a few turrets in here. Uh, it has a couple of outputs for recorders, milliamps and millivolts. I've never experimented with those. i got an idea that this puts out millivolts uh, relative to counts. This one puts out milliamps relative to counts. Um, Preamp, God knows what. And I, the only thing I've noticed is power does go out to this DC, high voltage DC. goes out to that in your detector input. Place to wrap the cord and speaker out, speaker out holes. Yeah, it's got fuse. Um, very nice sockets for those two uh, connections. I f I'm guessing these are switchcraft just by the the style very very well made. I mean everything about this. The, all the pots are Allen Bradley uh, vintage. Uh, resistors bigger than they really needed. These things do not get hot at all in any mode of operation. It has a bunch of calibration points. These aren't marked and I suppose that marking goes with this one, this one to that one and so forth. Uh, it looks like those are calibrations for each of the ranges. Uh, that'd be my supposition. Uh, there, there's another pot somewhere. Yeah, we won't worry about that. Um, I like I said I've never turned any of I've never turned any of these pots. Uh, it works the way it is. It's just used for demonstration purposes. Uh, so I'll just leave it be. If it's if it's good enough, it seems to be reasonably accurate. Another thing that's interesting. This has down here these five little neon bulbs there's another one buried up here which you can't see but um, when this thing's on they all five light up now when I got this one of them would have been broken meaning the, the lead had broken off I was able to fix it fortunately uh, guessing these are probably uh, NE2's NE2H maybe actually I think they are NE2H because of the way they the orangeness of the glow. Uh, I believe that that, even though it's wound around this rotary switch, I don't think it has anything to do with that. what that rotary switch uh, mode is in. I think they just used unused terminals on the switch as a convenient place to put these. What I'm guessing is that, it's, that what they, it, each one of these would have about 90 volts or so, maybe 60 volts across it. Um, my guess is they strung them all in series and that gives a stable more or less voltage regulated source for something in here that needs it. So I'll turn this thing back on and illustrate that a little bit. Yeah, you see once the rectifier warms up things get charged up those will Come on, there they go. Now we'll turn the bright light off. Now you can see them. They're lit. And say there's another one up in here. Uh, probably for a similar purpose, just to stabilize a, a, a supply voltage somewhere. Um, huh? Really happy to have this thing and be able to demonstrate it a little bit.
pretty pretty cool box. Of course, I love the tubes. I'm be careful not to stick my fingers in the wrong place. It will bite. Back. The uh, newer models, or I think they're newer models. I, I'm assuming they are because um, they had rather than a uh, probe mount on the side of the box, it was in the back. So the, the smaller diameter probes, more modern, snapped onto the back rather than on the side, this big bulky honking chrome plate or nickel plated thing. And uh, it's not for sale yet. 